Hyperkalemia, Part 1, Causes and Signs and Symptoms. Hi again, everybody. We will begin our lecture series on electrolytes by focusing in on potassium, specifically hyperkalemia. We will start with Part 1, which will cover the causes and signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia. In Part 2, we will discuss its treatment. Here are some facts about potassium. The normal potassium concentration in the serum is maintained within a narrow range of 3.5 to 5 MEQs per liter. 98% of the total body potassium resides intracellularly, predominantly in the muscle, and only 2% is found in the extracellular compartment, intravascular and interstitial spaces. In the intracellular fluid inside the cells, the normal potassium concentration is 140 to 150 MEQs per liter. The sodium potassium pump actively transports sodium and potassium across the cell membrane. Shifting of as little as 2% of the total body's potassium from the intracellular to the extracellular space can double the plasma potassium concentration. Notice in the diagram just how a small amount of potassium migrating outside of the cell and into the blood can be significant. This redistribution of cellular potassium can cause acute hyperkalemia. We'll talk more about this later. The normal daily intake of potassium ranges between 50 and 100 MEQs. The total amount of potassium stored in the body is approximately 45 to 55 MEQs per kilogram and varies with age, sex, and muscle mass. Let's go over some of the physiology of potassium. Potassium plays a major role in transmitting and conducting nerve impulses, including contractions of cardiac, skeletal, and smooth muscles. Potassium is required for neuromuscular excitability, primarily by maintaining the electric resting and action potential of the cell membrane. The ratio of extracellular to intracellular potassium concentration determines the cell membrane resting electrical potential. This then affects nerve impulse transmission and regulates the function of excitable tissues, cardiac and skeletal muscle, and nerve. A high intracellular concentration of potassium is essential to maintain the resting membrane potential for cellular excitability and contraction. This disproportionate intracellular concentration of potassium is maintained by the sodium potassium ATPase pump located in the cell membrane, which transports sodium out of the cell in exchange for potassium. This leads to a potassium gradient across the cell membrane, which maintains the potential difference across the membrane. This potential difference is especially important in excitable tissues such as nerve and muscle. Small changes in this balance can significantly alter serum potassium levels and affect the actions of cardiovascular and neuromuscular tissue functioning. As we will further see, different hormonal factors regulate the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase pump, namely insulin, catecholamines, and aldosterone, and to a lesser extent, acid-base balance. Two mechanisms normally regulate potassium levels in response to variation of potassium intake. First, after a meal, ingested potassium rapidly enters the portal circulation, stimulating the pancreas to release insulin. Elevated insulin levels causes rapid transport of potassium from the extracellular space into the cells via the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Insulin, the most important regulator, stimulates the sodium potassium ATPase pump, resulting in enhanced potassium uptake by muscle, liver, and adipose tissue. Secondarily, increased potassium in the circulation causes the renal juxtular glomerular cells to release renin. This stimulates hepatic activation of angiotensin I that is then converted in the lungs to angiotensin II. Angiotensin II stimulates the adrenal cortical cells to secrete aldosterone. Elevated serum aldosterone causes the renal cortical collecting ducts to excrete potassium and retain sodium, further lowering serum potassium. 
These mechanisms occur until the kidneys have sufficient time to excrete the dietary potassium load and reestablish total body potassium content. Approximately 90% of the ingested potassium is eliminated by the kidneys and approximately 10% is eliminated via the GI tract. In individuals with normal renal function, the kidneys are responsible for elimination of about 95% of the daily potassium load, with the remainder exiting through the gut. Potassium is freely filtered by the glomerulus and then reabsorbed by the proximal tubule and ascending limb, such that only a small amount reaches the distal nephron. Maintenance of total body potassium content is primarily the job of the kidneys, with a small contribution by the GI tract. Regulation of potassium excretion takes place in the nephron, influenced by two factors, the rate of flow of solute, sodium and chloride delivery, and the effect of aldosterone. Sodium and potassium have a reciprocal relationship. When aldosterone is secreted, the kidneys reabsorb sodium and excrete potassium. Now let's move on and talk about hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is defined as a serum potassium level greater than 5.0 MEQ per liter. Hyperkalemia is the most dangerous acute electrolyte abnormality, potentially leading to life-threatening arrhythmias and death. It is thought that potassium levels greater than 6.0 MEQ per liter are clinically significant. When potassium levels increase abruptly, Clinical signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia may be obvious at serum levels of 6 to 7 MEQ per liter. Immediate and emergent treatment are required for potassium concentrations above 7.5 MEQ per liter since severe muscle weakness and or marked ECG changes are potentially life-threatening. Let's go over the causes of hyperkalemia. Pseudohyperkalemia is an in vitro phenomena due to the mechanical release of potassium from cells during the phlebotomy procedure or specimen processing. The most common cause is license of red blood cells in a phlebotomy specimen. If the sample was drawn using poor technique, the potassium results may be falsely high. Don't be fooled by an incorrect falsely elevated potassium level. Renal failure. Since the kidneys are the primary route for potassium excretion, Renal failure, acute or chronic, is the most common cause of hyperkalemia. The glomerular filtration rate before the onset of hyperkalemia is usually below 10 to 20 mL per minute. In acute kidney injury, the rapid decline in glomerular filtration rate and reduction in functioning nephron mass lead to decreased distal potassium secretion. Excessive intake of potassium. Dietary sources particularly enriched with potassium include bananas, melons, citrus juice, potatoes, and avocados. Potassium supplements or salt substitutes can contribute to excessive serum levels of the electrolyte and can be a hidden source of dietary potassium. However, in the presence of normal renal and adrenal function, it is difficult to ingest enough potassium to develop hyperkalemia. Dietary intake as a contributor to hyperkalemia is usually in the setting of impaired kidney function. Trauma. Tissue damage is an important cause of hyperkalemia. This occurs due to the cellular destruction and redistribution of potassium out of damaged cells into extracellular spaces. This can be due to rhabdomyolysis, hypothermia, burns, intravascular coagulation, and tumor lysis. Another cause might be hypoaldosteronism. This phenomena is seen in Addison's disease and in other disorders of adrenal insufficiency. Lack of aldosterone in the kidneys will cause potassium to be retained and sodium to be excreted. In metabolic acidosis, excess hydrogen ions in the extracellular fluid increases and move into cells, pushing potassium ions out of the cell into the extracellular fluid. For each hydrogen ion that enters the cell, one potassium ion leaves the cell in order to maintain electrode neutrality. This acidosis can cause hyperkalemia. There is a limit to the amount of cation shifting that can occur, 
and such a shift can cause a temporary relative hyperkalemia. Also, the increase in serum potassium doesn't represent an actual increase in the body's overall potassium content. In metabolic acidosis, the hyperkalemia is due to a temporary shift of potassium out of the cell. Lactic acidosis is often associated with potassium shift, but this effect is due to loss of cell integrity as a result of cell ischemia. Hyperkalemia in diabetic ketoacidosis is the result of insulin deficiency and hypertonicity, and not the acidosis. There are three drug classes that can cause hyperkalemia. These are drugs that interfere with potassium excretion, particularly in renal impairment. The first class is angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, or angiotensin II receptor antagonists, ACE inhibitors, or ARBs. The second class are aldosterone-inhibiting mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, such as spironolactone. And the third class are potassium-sparing diuretics, such as triamterene. Patients taking an ACE inhibitor or ARB are prone to hyperkalemia because these classes of drugs decrease aldosterone synthesis and thus reduce renal potassium secretion. These drugs block the effect of angiotensin II, resulting in a decrease in aldosterone levels, causing sodium elimination and potassium retention. ARBs may be less likely to cause hyperkalemia than ACE inhibitors. In patients with normal kidney function, ACE inhibitors or ARBs are associated with hyperkalemia relatively infrequently. Mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists include the drugs spironolactone and aprenolone. These drugs will compete with and antagonize the effect of aldosterone, thus decreasing potassium excretion in the kidneys and increase the risk of hyperkalemia. Here's the angiotensin pathway where spironolactone will block aldosterone's effect, leading to a decrease in potassium excretion. Potassium-sparing diuretics include such drugs as triamterene, indiazide, and amylaride. These drugs inhibit sodium conductance channels in the kidney and block the entry of sodium, resulting in decreased potassium secretion. Other drugs that may cause hyperkalemia include trimethoprim, pentamidine, cyclosporin, and tacrolimus. Signs and Symptoms of Hyperkalemia The initial signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia involve GI effects, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramping, and diarrhea caused by smooth muscle hyperactivity in the GI tract. Neuromuscular signs and symptoms then occur, including muscle cramps, generalized weakness, paresthesias, fasciculations in the arms and legs, tetany, and focal or global paralysis. Signs and symptoms of progressive skeletal muscle weakness, dyspnea, and decreased deep tendon reflexes occur. Finally, cardiac effects occur. Hyperkalemia causes cardiotoxicity by depolarizing the cell membrane, slowing ventricular conduction, and decreasing the duration of the action potential. These effects are associated with a slowdown of cardiac conduction. The classic electrocardiographic changes of hyperkalemia occur as follows. First, we see narrow tall peak T waves, followed by ST segment depression, a prolonged PR interval, widening of the QRS interval, loss of the P wave, and then the development of a sine wave pattern. This will eventually lead to ventricular fibrillation and asystole if not corrected. Here's a diagram of how hyperkalemia is exhibited on the ECG. Here is the tall peak T wave, the loss of the P wave, and then finally widened QRS with a tall T wave. In summary, we previously stated the normal serum potassium concentration and the concentration it reaches during hyperkalemia. We described three mechanisms by which potassium is regulated in the body. We listed the main cause of hyperkalemia and four other non-drug causes. We named three drugs that can cause hyperkalemia and explained their mechanisms. 
We describe the GI and neuromuscular signs and symptoms that occur with hyperkalemia, and we outline seven EKG changes that are observed with progressive worsening hyperkalemia. Coming up next in part two of this series, we will outline the three key goals of treating hyperkalemia. We'll state four key differences between calcium gluconate and calcium chloride. Explain how insulin glucose and inhaled albuterol work to decrease potassium in hyperkalemia and review their dosages. We'll specify when sodium bicarbonate should be used to treat hyperkalemia and describe the use of sodium polystyrene sulfonate, including mechanism, route, dose, efficacy, and toxicities. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEasy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.